G'day, welcome to yet another episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. My name is Chris Muir, I'm a Product Manager working for Oracle Corporation in Perth, Australia. Now as extension to our previous episodes in the channel, what we'd like to talk about today is again bounded task load transaction options to specifically talk about the finalisation of the transaction associated with the bounded task load or the controller layer. So in the previous uh, episode, we alluded to the different transaction options and that you would potentially use the task load return commit and rollback activities to finalise the overall transaction. This is what we want to talk about in more detail today. Now, as a reminder of the transaction options, you have four options. You have always begin new transaction, always use existing transaction, use existing transaction if possible, and no controller transaction. Now, in reality, it's three options, the first three plus the fourth one that turns it off. The first three options enforce transaction behavior and controls at the controller or task flow level, where the fourth option says, no, let's not deal with transactions at the task flow level, just leave it up to the individual data control instances. Now, with regards to that fourth option, the no controller transaction option, if you want to finalize a transaction that maybe the data control instances, maybe a ADF VC data control instance is currently uh, undertaking, then as a programmer on behalf of the user, you will actually call the commit or rollback operations typically dragged in from the data control palette. But for the other three transaction options, specifically, again, always begin new transaction, uh, use existing transaction if possible and always use existing transaction, those three options require that you use the task flow return activity, commits and rollbacks in order to finalize the transaction that's being tracked at the bounded task flow or controller layer and as we said in the previous episode, the data control frame which is the internal ADF runtime object behind the scenes. So in this episode, let's just talk a little bit more detail about the task flow return commit and rollback activities, when they are actually used, when they come into play, um, and what, how you need to configure them, particularly from, again, a design, an architect's, and a senior developer's perspective. So how do you configure this task flow return activity? Just as quickly as a reminder, if you have your bounded task flow diagram in front of you in the JDeveloper IDE, from the component palette, you drag in these task flow return activities, and these are the final step in your bounded task flow. Thus, if you bounded task flow when you navigate to one of these items, it will be responsible for closing down the bounded task flow and returning to the caller. Now, in terms of the task flow return activity, it includes a property is available in the property inspector called end transaction. That has three values, essentially none, so don't do anything with the transaction, or commit a rollback. So this is how you commit a rollback, the overall transaction associated with the bounded task flows or the ADF controller layer, or internally at runtime, the data control frame, which are all logically the same object. Now remember the activity of uh, issuing a commit via task flow return activity is that the data control frame may have one or more heterogeneous data control types or instances associated with it and this will cause those to commit, um, all of those to commit as such. Obviously rollback again does the opposite, it tells all the under underlying data control instances to roll back and not undertake, uh, effectively undo any work that's been done since the beginning of the data control frame or the original guy that started the transaction on the controller. Now, that's not the only way to commit or roll back uh, the data control frame or the overall chain set of bounded task flows because you also have a programmatic manner, a programmatic solution for doing that where from your managed beans at the view controller layer, you can uh, grab the current data control frame associated with the bounded task flows that you're currently operating within. And via that data control frame and a little bit of code, you can also issue commit and rollback commands if that's what you want to do. Now, a question I typically get at this point is, well, you know, it's great that we've got these transaction options and the ability to commit and roll back them via the task flow return activity. But traditionally as a programmer, what I do to commit and roll back a data control was I would drag the commit and roll back operations from the data control palette. So what happens if I've got these transaction options, so the three options I was alluding to before, and I accidentally make use of the commit and roll backs from the data control palette, what happens? Well, ultimately, the data control instance will commit and roll back, depending on which operation you call. Oh, all right. But the thing is, is that now you're actually managing the transactions at the data control instance layer. So if you have other data controls that you have involved in your overall application, you'll need to now manage those yourselves and commit and roll back them. And you can see that kind of here what's occurring is that the options are kind of a foggle. If you're going to use the transaction options, 
you really should use the task load return uh, commits and rollbacks or alternately use the no controller transaction option and commit and roll back the data control instances yourself but don't mix and match because you're basically using two different mechanisms for attempting to achieve uh, the same thing. Now if you've only got one data control instance well the it's kind of easy to say don't bother with the transaction options only use the no controller transaction option and commit and roll back the individual data control instance itself but again if you've got a number of heterogeneous data control services data control types and instances then you really want to use these transaction options at the controller layer the task flow return commit and rollbacks at the transaction layer and therefore don't go and start committing and rollbacking the individual instances of the data control because it's going to be very hard to track what's going on use one mechanism or the other don't use both in combination so in considering the task flow return commit and rollback operations Again, obviously what they're designed to do is to commit and roll back all the data control instances attached to the current controller transaction or the, only the data control frame. Now at design time, if you uh, configure your bounded task flows with these transaction options, again, always begin new transaction, use existing transaction if possible, and always use existing transaction if possible. At design time within the bounded task flow, the IDE will actually warn you if you need to include a task flow return commit or rollback or not. Okay, so you will actually get little warning icons on your task flow returns and um, it will try to indicate to you mm, for a particular type of task flow using a particular type of transaction option if you require the commit or rollback or not. A little caveat here though is that that's only a warning and basically JDeveloper will not enforce those. As such at runtime, if you are missing the options, well, bad luck, okay, if you were required to have the commit and rollback option you, you didn't, your application potentially won't work the way you want it. And vice versa, if you're not meant to have those options set, well, it'll just ignore them anyway. So a little caveat there is you really need to think about where you are actually setting these at design time to get the right behavior. So in context of where you should set the commit and rollback task or return activity and not, what are the actual guidelines? Well, in terms of commit and rollback, task flow return, commit and rollback, only the bounded task flow that starts the transaction on the controller can actually commit and roll back all the bounded task flows that are actually attached to the current data control frame. So you can imagine we will have a number of chain bounded task flows where we will have initially either an always begin new transaction bounded task flow or a use existing transaction if possible bounded task flow which defaults to at runtime always begin new transaction and you've set the isolated data control scope option to start the transaction on the overall uh, banner task flow and then the underlying data control frame. It is that banner task flow that requires a task flow, re uh, task flow return commit and rollback. Now conversely, if you have banner task flows that have the options always use existing transaction set or alternatively they had the option uh, use existing transaction if possible set but at runtime that actually resolves to always use existing transaction and you have a shared data control scope in that context the bounded task flow will not create a new data control frame and create a transaction it will join to the previous bounded task flow's data control frame and in that case the task flow return if you set a commit a rollback at runtime, it will be ignored. It relies on the calling bounded task flow to do the commit and rollback, not the current uh, bounded task flow as such. So another question I often get at this point is, what happens if we're using the use existing if transaction possible option for bounded task flows? Now, when I'm designing these particular bounded task flows, I might not know the caller, what the, what, if the caller has a data control frame or a transaction underway. I don't know if when my bounded task flow is instantiated, will I actually be the one who is responsible for creating the data control frame and the transaction or not? Because as we've described in the previous episode, the behavior of the use existing transaction if possible option is totally dynamic and it can change the way that it works. So in terms of the task flow return activities, commit and rollback, do I include commit and rollback or don't I include the commit and rollback? Because I don't know how this guy is actually going to operate at runtime. Well, the simple answer is, and I kind of alluded to this before, is definitely include the task flow return commit and rollback 
and if the data task flow that is using this option is actually the one that starts the data control frame and the associated transaction then at the conclusion of that data task flow it will actually issue a real commit or rollback but alternatively if it's one that joins or starts and realizes that there's already a data control frame and a transaction underway it won't create its own and the task flow return commit and rollback which you have set here will just be ignored at runtime so now you can see why Oracle just ignores it and doesn't throw an error at runtime because there's a specific case, this sort of dynamic case, where we don't actually want it to uh, do the commit and rollback. We just say, well, you know, you're not in charge of the transaction and the data control frame here. Um, let's revert back to the calling bounded task flow actually issuing the commit and rollback at some stage. So that concludes this particular episode of the ADF Architecture TV channel. In the next episode, we will look at the last concept in terms of the transaction options on the task flows, and that is the concept of the prematurely terminating task flow. And this will show you an interesting scenario where what happens if a banner task flow is underway and participating in a transaction, but for whatever reason that banner task flow terminates prematurely, what happens to the transaction under the covers? So thanks again for joining us today and I hope we'll see you in the next episode very soon.